Aladdin. Long, long ago and many miles away in a wild country of deserts and mountains and a few green river valleys lived a boy called Aladdin. Once Aladdin's life had been quite comfortable and happy, but that had been before his father, Mustafa the tailor, had died. Now Aladdin's mother was a poor widow and life was rather grim. Somehow there was never quite enough money to buy all the food they needed and never quite enough wood to burn to keep Aladdin and his mother warm in the cold weather. Ah, well, never mind, Aladdin's mother would smile, we still have each other and something nice is sure to turn up sometime. And one day something nice did turn up, or so it seemed at the time. The whole adventure started when Aladdin went out looking for work. He had only trotted a few paces when a grand stranger came up to him and said. Who are you, my lad? I am Aladdin, the son of Mustafa the tailor, replied Aladdin. I thought so, smiled the stranger. Why, you are the image of your father. Now just hurry home, my boy, and tell your mother that I will be round in a few minutes to visit her. Aladdin's mother was quite puzzled. She didn't know any grand folk at all, but she prepared for a visitor as best she could in her poe. But when the stranger arrived he brought a servant with him carrying the most magnificent food. I am Mustafa's long lost brother and all your troubles are over, he smiled, how amazing. And it was especially amazing as Aladdin's mother had never heard that her husband Mustafa had a brother at all. But the stranger was so friendly and kind and generous that it really seemed foolish to seek to find fault with him. Aladdin's uncle, as it seemed the stranger was, bought new clothes for Aladdin and his mother, stocked the house with food and fuel for the cold weather and even bought Aladdin a fine horse. How very pleasant life had become. If only everything the stranger said had been true. But alas. The stranger was not speaking the truth at all. He was not Aladdin's uncle. He was a wicked magician and he was only being so friendly because he needed Aladdin's help. Well, several happy days of plenty passed by and then Aladdin's so-called uncle invited Aladdin to go for a ride in the mountains on the fine new horse. Listen carefully, Aladdin, said the magician, as they rode along. If you do just as I say, you will become very rich, richer even than I am, if that is possible. I will do as you say, uncle, smiled Aladdin, because he was quite sure that his uncle was a good and kind man. Poor Aladdin. There he was being so trustful and the man he was with wasn't even his uncle, let alone good and kind. However, they rode up into the mountains till they came to the spot that the magician sought. We will dismount from our horses here, smiled the magician, and I will build a fire. This did not bother Aladdin. He merely thought his uncle was going to cook some food, but then, what a surprise. The magician threw some powder onto the fire and the ground began to crack and tremble. Dense smoke swirled all around and when it cleared, Aladdin saw a flat stone set into the ground with an iron ring embedded in it. Aladdin was looking at a trap door. The magician acted as if nothing unusual had happened at all. Aladdin, my boy, he smiled, just lift up that trap door and pop down the steps that you will see, there's a good chap. Go down the steps went on the magician, and you will find yourself in a beautiful garden. There you will find a rusty old lamp. Now listen carefully, you are to bring that lamp straight back to me. Understand? Yes, uncle, replied Aladdin. He was rather surprised to see a greedy expression on his uncle's face. Good lad, smiled the magician greasily. I appreciate your help very much indeed. He slipped a cheap-looking brass ring from his finger and handed it to Aladdin. Here, Aladdin, take this for all your trouble. He did not tell Aladdin that the brass ring was in fact a magic ring, neither did he tell him that the lamp was a magic lamp. He thought that Aladdin was far too stupid to understand magical matters. The magician, during one of his many strange adventures, had once been trapped in an underground cave and had only narrowly escaped with his life. Ever since then he had always avoided underground caves and that was why he wanted Aladdin to go down and fetch him the lamp. But Aladdin remembered that greedy expression on his uncle's face and when he found the lamp, an uneasy feeling prompted him to say, I think I'll keep this old lamp for myself, uncle. 
In sudden rage the magician slammed down the trap door. Aladdin was trapped. For hours the lad was in despair. Then, wondering what he should do, he clasped his hands and in so doing happened to rub the brass ring. To his amazement, there came a blinding flash of light and a huge genie appeared. What is your command, master? he asked. Well, as you can imagine, the thing that Aladdin wanted most of all was to go home to his mother. But first, he picked up the old lamp and then he picked some of the fruit from the pretty garden. The fruit was so bright and shiny that Aladdin was sure his mother would like it. Then Aladdin turned to the genie of the ring. Take me home, please, he said. Poof. In a flash, Aladdin was home with his mother. How surprised she was to see him and Aladdin had to explain about how his uncle had shut him in the underground garden and how he had escaped with the help of the genie of the ring. What a strange affair. Aladdin's mother picked up the old lamp. What a dirty thing, she said and gave it a rub. Goodness. There was a flash of light and great clouds of green and red and blue smoke swirled around the room as another huge genie appeared. I am the genie of the lamp and your wish is my command, he said. Astounding! exclaimed Aladdin. First one genie and now another. His mother fearfully covered her eyes. What magic was this? Now, after all his adventures, Aladdin was hungry. Bring us a meal, please, he said. And, at once the genie brought a wonderful meal on golden dishes standing on a gold tray. It was all a little frightening. Aladdin's mother began to feel quite upset. All this magic and flashing lights and genies popping up is just too much for me, she gasped. It isn't right for plain folk like us, Aladdin. Don't rub the ring or the magic lamp again. So Aladdin, who liked to please his mother, put the lamp away in a drawer and didn't touch it for years. And in actual fact there was no need. Whenever Aladdin or his mother needed any money, they just sold one of the gold dishes on which the genie had brought their magic meal, and when the dishes were gone, they sold the gold tray, and when all the gold was gone, they started to sell some of the bright fruit that Aladdin had brought back from the secret underground garden. For it turned out that the fruits were precious jewels. Now all this money lasted for years and years and Aladdin was a grown-up young man before even a quarter of the fruit, or jewels, as they actually were, had been sold. How happy life was! But then, alas and alack! Something happened to disturb all that calm happy life and in a moment Aladdin and his mother were plunged back into worry and adventure. One day, as Aladdin was walking through the town, he heard a lot of shouting and banging of drums and clattering of feet. Everyone fell back in fear to make way and striding proudly down the center of the road came a procession from the royal palace. And carried in the center of the procession, seated in a beautiful golden chair, was the king's daughter, Princess Badrul. Aladdin fell in love with her at once. Oh, what a shame! For how could Aladdin's love lead to anything but unhappiness? King's daughters do not marry the sons of poor tailors, by no means. But Aladdin's mind was made up. He went home and told his mother he was going to marry the king's daughter. Oh, Aladdin, Aladdin! gasped his mother. What foolish idea is this? You will never be allowed to marry the king's daughter. Why, the king will cut off our heads at the very idea. But as it happened, for once Aladdin's mother was wrong. The king was a man greedy for wealth, as Aladdin knew well, and Aladdin sent his mother to the palace to show the king the fruit jewels from the secret garden. The king's tiny eyes shone. Tell your son that if he sends me forty trays of jewels, as good as the jewels you are showing me, together with twenty Greek slaves and twenty African slaves, and if he builds a palace next to my own, but much more splendid, oh, and it must be finished all in one day, if he does all that, then he may marry my daughter. It all seemed terribly difficult to Aladdin's mother, but of course with the help of the magic lamp, which Aladdin took from its straw, all the difficult tasks were accomplished with no trouble. And then dressed in magnificent clothes, and riding a white horse, followed by a procession of the slaves carrying the jewels and his mother riding in a palanquin, Aladdin went to the palace to claim the hand of the princess. 
Of course in his wonderful new clothes Aladdin looked very important and as so Doten as he arrived at the palace he was shown in to see the king. I have brought the 40 trays of jewels carried by the 20 Greek slaves and the 20 African slaves, your majesty, bowed Aladdin. The king was amazed, because he had not really believed that anyone could do the things he had asked Aladdin to do. However, he looked at all the jewels and the slaves and he was very pleased. You seem like just the sort of son-in-law I have been looking for, he smiled. Then he remembered he had asked for a magnificent palace to be built next door. But what about that palace, eh? He smiled, quite sure that Aladdin could never have built a palace in a day. Look over your shoulder, your majesty, replied Aladdin. The king looked. Amazing. Next to his own palace the king saw a fantastic building, more marvelous than anything he had ever seen before in his life. I can see that you will be a really useful sort of chap to have about the place, beamed the king. You may marry my daughter at once. So the king sent for his daughter Princess Badrul. You are to marry Aladdin, instructed the king. Luckily Princess Badrul fell in love with Aladdin at first sight, or things could have been rather difficult, but they did get married and they lived very happily for quite a long time, but not for ever after. Unfortunately there was still trouble in store for poor Aladdin, who had never done a day's harm to anyone. But great wealth often brings great trouble. Now, you may have been wondering what happened to the wicked magician after he slammed the door on Aladdin and, as he thought, locked Aladdin in the secret underground garden forever. Well, the magician had been quite happy for years doing bad deeds and thinking how miserable Aladdin must be in the secret garden and serve him jolly well right, he thought. But the day came when the magician thought he would like to make another attempt at obtaining the magic lamp and then when he started making a few inquiries he learned of Aladdin's escape and present good fortune. He was furious. At once he thought of a plan to get the magic lamp for himself. Disguised as a peddler, he took a basket of lamps all shiny and new and stood outside Aladdin's palace calling. New lamps for old. New lamps for old. Now by ill chance a servant girl heard him. And by even worse chance it happened to be a girl who had seen the magic lamp in Aladdin's room. At once she exchanged the old magic lamp for a new lamp. How clever I am, she smiled, but oh, what trouble she was making. As soon as the magician had the lamp in his hands, he rubbed it and summoned the genie. Your wish is my command, O oh master, bowed the genie. Yes, yes, all right, don't waste time chatting, snapped the magician. I want you to magic Aladdin's palace and the princess and all the riches and servants with me to the desert of Morocco. Poof. There was a blinding flash of light and Aladdin's lovely palace disappeared with everything in it. As it happened, Aladdin was out riding at the time. At once the king had him seized and thrown into prison. Poor Aladdin. What could he do? You see, the king was furious that his daughter had disappeared. I want my daughter back, you rascal, he shouted at Aladdin, and I shouldn't be sorry to see the palace back either, for it was worth a lot of money. I know you can do magic tricks, after all you built the palace in a day. So get my daughter and the palace back or you stay in prison forever. How unfair. Never mind. There was one good thing about the whole sorry business. Aladdin was still wearing the magic ring the magician had given him years ago and which he had used to get himself out of the secret underground garden. Aladdin pulled himself together and rubbed the magic ring. At once the genie of the ring appeared. Your wish is my command, he bowed. Thank goodness the magic of the ring is still working, smiled Aladdin. Then he asked the genie to take him to the princess, his wife. In a flash, Aladdin was in Morocco. When the magic smoke cleared, Aladdin found himself standing in the princess's bedroom. Thank goodness you are here, she gasped. The wicked magician is trying to make me marry him and tonight there is to be a wedding feast. At once Aladdin thought of a plan. That evening at the feast he hid behind the magician's chair and slipped a sleeping powder into his wine. When the magician slept, Aladdin took back the lamp from the magician's pocket, and then of course Aladdin's troubles were over. 
He called up the genie and ordered himself, the princess and the palace and everything in it, except the magician, to be taken back to their proper home. So then of course Aladdin and the princess and the king and Aladdin's mother were all very happy. And as Aladdin took good care of the lamp from then on, they lived happily ever after. As for the poor old wicked magician, he woke up cold and alone in the deserts of Morocco and decided not to bother with lamps anymore. Hooray! The end.